God is good. Amen? You know, I, I came across some uh, things that I want to share with you. Uh, how many people ever write, tried to write a text message or uh, an email, and you know that, that editor pops up and it changes the word, and you get these strangest kind of statements? Well, we've experienced that. I mean, we've all experienced that, but we, I've, I've also seen it in bulletins. You know, we don't really issue a bulletin anymore, but when we had bulletins, some of the strangest things would pop up. And then when you, you, know, you drive around town and you see churches you know, with their signs out, and some of those are, you have, to, you have to ask yourself, what did they really mean? So here's something that was found in a bulletin. For those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. I like this one. This afternoon, there will be a meeting in the south and north ends of the church. Children will be baptized at both ends. <laughs> Wednesday, the Ladies Literary, liturgic, Liturgical Society will meet. Mrs. Jones will sing, Put Me in My Little Bed, accompanied by the pastor. Some of these are bad. Thursday at 5 p.m., there will be a meeting of the Little Mothers Club, all wishing to become little mothers. <laughs> Please see the minister in his study. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we need proofreaders. My, 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 my sister Marion, she, 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 she's a proofreader. She spots things in the bulletin and in some of the things that even we produce. This being Easter Sunday, we will ask Mrs. Lewis to come forward and lay an egg on the altar. <laughs> All right, just one more. Let's see, one more here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm having so much fun up here. <laughs> At the evening service... Tonight, the sermon's topic will be, what is hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> amen. God is good. God has a sense of humor, amen. What I want to share with you today is a word that uh, I believe is uh, critical to our walk in the Lord. As you know, when we, when we look at the scriptures, we know that there are certain principles, there are certain kingdom principles, if you will. And I think what I'm about to share with you is one of the, probably one of the most important principles that we can embrace. How many people would agree with me that what's in this book is true? Can we say that? It's all true. You may not like what it has to say, but it's true. Uh, and the reality is that, that if, if we want to uh, walk in the fullness of all that God has for us, we have to embrace the truth of the Word of God. And uh, there, one of the truths that I think is so difficult for us as Christians to, to truly believe, we know it in our heads, we know where to go for in the scriptures, but to, to really embrace in our hearts and allow it to be the guiding light of our lives, and that is understanding how much God loves not, put, not, not, not how much God loves us, but how much God loves you. To put it on a personal level, God loves you. And I know you may be looking at yourself or thinking in your head, how can he love me? Doesn't he know me? Hey, the truth is he does know you and he loves you anyway. That's the amazing thing about God. You see, you see our, our relationship with his is not based on our performance. You know, we don't, we don't work for our relationship with him. But we receive what he has given us, and when we receive what God has given us, that's called grace. That's his grace. He gives us grace. He gives us what we don't deserve. He gives us what we can't earn. And when we begin to truly embrace how much God loves us, what you're going to find is it's going to change you. It has to change you. You can't stay the same when you know the creator of this universe loves you so much that out of the billions of people in the world, he knows you by name. 
Doesn't the word say that he, he knows the number of hairs on the top of your head? And in my case, it's getting easier every year. But see, that's, that, that, that's one of those truths that's so difficult for us to embrace because we know us. You know, I know myself. I know the thoughts that I have. You know, I, I, and, and we think, well, you, know, you know, God may love me on Tuesday, but, I, you know, I'm blown it by Wednesday. No, God loves you unconditionally. That's what's called in the Greek agape love or agape. And that's the kind of love that God wants us to develop in our own lives so that we can extend that kind of love to one another. He loves you. But we need to have our eyes open. I want to share with you a scripture that I hadn't really planned to do this morning, but it's in Ephesians. And they may not put it up on a screen because they, 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 you know, I didn't ask them to do that, but it's found in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. And what we need to understand about the Apostle Paul is that he was a bad guy. You know, before he met Jesus, he was persecuting Christians. He participated in the stoning of Stephen. He, 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 he was traveling. Remember, he was traveling from, from Jerusalem to, to um, Damascus in order to persecute Christians. And along the way, he has an experience, just like you've had an experience. You've had an experience with Jesus Christ. You made a decision to receive him into your life. Well, Paul did the same thing. And can you imagine what Paul must have felt at that moment? Realizing that in the name of God, he was persecuting Christians. How could God ever forgive him? But see, Paul had an understanding of God's grace. How much he loves us despite what we may have said, what we may have done, what we may have had happen to us, regardless of the thoughts that pass through our head. He loves you. And this is what he says. He says, he says in verse 17, of Ephesians 1, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. If the only thing you leave with today is, is realizing that Jesus represents God's love. And God gave Jesus so that you could have life and you could have life more abundantly. And then he goes on to say that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints. Come on, can you say with me, I'm a saint? I'm a saint. You know, I came from a tradition of growing up as a child where, you know, you go into church and they had these saints up on the wall. And, and listen, you know, St. Peter and St. Paul and St. this and St. that. Listen, you are the saints of God. You are his chosen ones. You are the ones he died for. You are the ones he has called to himself as a prized possession. And then 19 says, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the workings of his mighty power. We serve an awesome God, amen? And, 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 and the thing is, he will spare no expense. He will not uh, hold back. He is the God of the impossible. You know, you say, it's impossible for God to love me. I don't even love myself. Let's just take a moment right now. Heavenly Father, right now, I just speak to those that are having difficulty in loving themselves. Right now, you know who they are. Lord, by your Spirit, speak to them. Speak to them, Lord, that they would know how much they are loved by you. Who the people of Christ are today. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are love. You are love. The 
title uh, that I had given this in the, in the beginning is, uh, was the, the, you, you are the pearl of great price. And of course, there's a parable in the, that we'll get to in a second about that. But the title that I ended up with, which didn't get on the bulletin or anything, uh, is that you are worth, are you ready for this? You are worth 12 cows. What, did I hear somebody say, what? Well, you have to stay to the end to figure out what that is. You're worth 12 cows. Anyway, let's, let's move on. Let's take a look at the, what the Word says, and the Word is true. The Word applies to you. It doesn't apply to the person next to you. It may apply to them, but more importantly, you have to internalize the Word for yourself. It, it's talking about you. When we read the Word, we're not reading the Word so that we can preach to someone. We're reading the Word so that we might grow and expand in what God has done for us and in a greater understanding. That our eyes uh, would be, uh, the eyes of wisdom would be opened, that our eyes of revelation would be seen. We recognize that when God is talking about His great love for the church, He's talking about you. And, and, and the thing is, is that that love, which is, which is God's grace, that love is what causes you to want to change, just like we sang in the song. Dee and I have been married uh, for, don't know how this happened, uh, but we've been married now for 54 years. It was hard, man. I did a lot of work to change her, you know. No, <laughs> I'm only kidding. Listen, listen. Here, here, here's the thing, and I'm putting this in, in the natural, you know, in the natural, but it's true in the spiritual. I know how much my wife loves me. I, have, I know it. She'd take a bullet for me, you know. She, she would lay down her life for me. It's that kind of love that causes me to want to be the man that she can love. Does that make sense? You know, and this, you know, I, and, and I'm sure that, you know, she would say the same thing, you know, that she's in love with this great man. And, she, no, that didn't come out right, did it? <laughs> but in the same way, she knows, you know, she knows how much I love her. And therefore, she wants to be the, the woman uh, that I can love. And it's the same way with God. It, you know, when you get a grasp, when, it, when you fully realize, when you fully comprehend how much God loves you, you're going to say, you know, I used to do this in the past, but I can't do that anymore. You know, I used to think this way, but I now my, my mind has been renewed. You know, I, I, you know, I, I want to change because I, I, want, I want God to, you know, not that he can love me more because he can't love you more than he loves you now, but the thing is, I want to fulfill his will for my life. I want him to be the man or the woman that he created me to be. Not the man or the woman that the world has shaped me to be, but the, the man or the woman that he has created me to be. And it's only then that I'm going to find fullness and fulfillment and purpose in life when I, when, I can, when I can throw away the thoughts that other people have had about me the words that the, the evil words that have been spoken over my life, you know, the, the 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 cruel things that have been done to me by others in my life, and I can embrace my new life in Christ. Hallelujah. Your your new life in Christ. I, I'm I'm starting to preach here. I got I got to get back to the word here now. Here, Matthew thirteen forty five. Jesus is speaking. Can Jesus lie? When Jesus speaks, who's he speaking to? That's right. Say that with me. When Jesus speaks, he's speaking to me. Not me, me, but me, me. Here we go. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 45. Again, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. Well, who's the merchant? Merchant, this is a parable. That means that this is a natural example of spiritual truth. And so the merchant is God. So again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant or God seeking beautiful pearls. You are that beautiful pearl. You are the beautiful pearl. Who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it with the blood of Jesus Christ. You were 
hurt you. These are, they're not just words on the page. It's truth. You were purchased through the blood of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you agree that if someone's willing to die for you, they've got to love you? God loves her. God loves her. And because of his great love, it's going to cause you to want to change when you truly embrace it, when it becomes real inside of you. In Matthew 10, 31, beginning, uh, uh, make that Matthew 10, beginning in verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Throughout, these, throughout the Bible, throughout the New Testament in particular, we, we see God's love being demonstrated by so many parables, so many examples, and the reality that he sent Jesus Christ for you because God so loved who? The world that whoever would believe upon Jesus would not perish but have everlasting life. We serve an awesome God. And that awesome God, I mean, the creator of the universe, Loves you. That's hard to believe, isn't it? But where does it say that? It says that in here. So therefore, it must be what? True. So it's true regardless of how I feel. It's true regardless of how I think. It's true regardless of what others have said. The truth is that God loves you. You have value to God. See, your value is not in how you see yourself. That's the problem. You know, we look at ourselves and, we, and we, 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 we see ourselves a certain way because we've been taught to think that way. But the thing is, your value is in how God sees you. Not how you see yourself, but how God sees you. And so you have to come to a place where you say, God is real, God is true, and if I've believed something all of my life, it's a lie. But God is true. God loves me. God loves you. And therefore, I'm the apple of his eye. My, you know, whenever, whenever someone says, you know, God so loved the world, my wife will often sneak in that phrase, but I'm his favorite. Yeah, God may love the world, but each of you as an individual can say that I'm his favorite. I know it's hard to receive. You can believe it for the person next to you. You know, you can believe it for the person behind you. But when you say, I'm his favorite, that's hard to receive. That's hard to accept. But it's true. He loves you. We know that our walk with God, our walk in our relationship with God is a is a, is a faith walk. We walk by faith and not by sight. And our faith, it, that means that, that we have to not only act like we, we believe, but we have to actually perform like we believe. Our behavior has to line up with what we believe. Do you behave like a person who is loved by God? You know, when, as, as I said, in my example for, for in my relationship with B, my wife, uh, I didn't know how to be a husband. You know, I didn't know, you know, all I could think about was, wow, she's hot, you know, I, I'm, I love her, you know. Uh, and then, then you get married, and then you realize, well, wait a minute, there's much more to it than that, right? Uh, and and I, I, how, do, how, do I, how do I become the man that she would truly fall in love with? She thought I was hot, too. That's a bad combination. We got married after three months. Four months, I'm sorry. We extended. But it worked out 54 years later. Why? Because we kept Jesus at the center of our marriage. We were married for 10 years before we knew Christ. And it was rocky. You know, uh, 
not Rocky Road like the ice cream. It was, it was rough. But when we came to Christ, we now had a central foundation upon which to build our lives. We began to understand what God wanted from us and how to be empowered to to do what God wanted us to do. And we truly began to fall in love all over again. As I said, she's she's not the woman that I married so so many years ago. I'm still the wonderful guy she married. I came out wrong. Am I am I going to have to pay for this later, D? <laughs> you know, you've all heard it said, don't let that as, as a Christian, we can't let our past define our future, right? Because we know that 1 Corinthians uh, 2 Corinthians 5:17 says that in Christ you are new creations, the old, what's that? The past has passed away, has has gone away, and all things have now become new. And, and I'll tell you what, for, for a believer, that's every day. You know, yesterday has passed away. You know, you may be, you know, you know and, and you may have to say the same thing tomorrow, but it has passed away. But as you understand and embrace God's love for you and realize how much he loves you, that it's, it's going to cause you to change. The Holy Spirit is, in you is going to have something to work with. He's going to remind you how precious you are in God's sight going to remind you of how, how much God values you. He's going to remind you of, of the fact that God does have a, a perfect plan for your life. And that it's in that plan that you're going to find peace. You're going to find joy. You're going to find a purpose. It's all found in him. I, I have a $20 bill here. I brought this out this morning. Uh, how much is a $20 bill worth? Okay, it's how much was a $20 bill worth two years ago? Hmm. Uh, not worth as much today. It's not a political statement. Actually. Anyway. $20, right? If I fold it, what's it worth? 20 bucks. Fold it again, small. What's it worth? Wow. What about if I crush it? $20. This is amazing. It just doesn't change. Hey, what if I just uh, stomp on it a little bit and grind it into the dirt? $20. In other words, its value doesn't change. It doesn't matter whether it's been folded or crumpled or stepped on. And, and, and that's true for you. You may have been folded. You may have been twisted. You may have been crumpled in your life. You may have had people step on you, and you think your value is based upon the things that have been done to you, but your value never changes to God. The day you were born to now, your value doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, forever. That's how you have to... It's not based upon your performance. It's not based upon whether you're all wrinkled. No, that was no allusion to being old. I'm just saying, you know. It doesn't make a difference what you look like. What matters is that God saw you. And he said, I'm willing to give my son for you. I'm willing to give my son for you. I'm willing to give my son for you. Nothing can be more valuable than that. I remember as a kid, uh, I came from, my parents were deaf mute. Some of you know that. Uh, I lived in a, in a home. Uh, well, we were poor. I didn't realize how poor until I grew up. But we were poor. We didn't have much, but we had always had enough. Uh, life was very simple in our household. Uh, and, and around the family table, uh, it was basically my brother and I. Uh, my sister hadn't been born yet. And uh, we grew up, and there was not much conversation. My sign, you know, sign line, signing inside of a, a, a family like ours, there wasn't much going on, not much communication. And one, one day I, I was invited to my friend's house, and he was, uh, his, name was, uh, his name was Guy, his family name was Taglarine, so you can guess he was Italian. And uh, they invited me over for uh, a, a dinner. I, I think it, it might have been Thanksgiving. And there was this table. 
just loaded with food. And, 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 and my friend Guy had, uh, had two sisters, and they were there, and the mother and the father, and, and they're just talking, and, 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 and it, was just, it was just incredible. It was, it was a whole new experience for me. You know, in my house, here's what you hear. Did you hear that? In a deaf home, that's what you hear. You know, that's our, our, one of the, we still have this problem between Dee and myself. Dee came from, she's Italian, she came from a, in a family of, of seven uh, kids, and uh, there was always noise, always music in the background. You know, it was always, and I came from a family where, so in my house, Dee has to have music playing all the time. And she has to have it loud. And it drives me a little bit crazy sometimes. Even, listen, uh, I'm, I'm confessing. Even Christian music. Sometimes you can just have a little bit too much, too loud uh, for my sensitive ears. But here, I'm at this dinner. It is like, it's, it's like a scene from a movie. And I think to myself, I want to be in their family. How many people ever felt that way? You wished you were born into someone else's family. Or maybe you thought, you know, I'm really a prince or a princess. And I'm adopted. And one day, they're gonna f- I'm going to find out who I really am. And, hey, listen, that day has come. You are a child of God. Amen? You are a, you are a, a beautiful in his sight. Uh, every wonderful, great and wonderful thing that he has, it becomes available to you as you begin to embrace who you are as a child of God. You are loved by your Father in heaven. And I know that when I say that, I have to be careful because some of you have experienced hard things from your father. You know, some of you have had fathers that were not fathers at all. Some of you have not had a father. And therefore find it hard to trust the father image that we find in the Scripture. But your Father in heaven loves you. He goes, that's my daughter. Hey, he's a son of mine. That's because he loves me. See, we have to learn how to see ourselves in a, in a different light. I think Romans 12 one, verses 1 and 2, very familiar verse for many of you, uh, really gives us instruction of, on how to live. But you have to live with the perspective, I'm loved by my Father in heaven. And when I, when I'm, when I have that perspective, when I, when I see myself as being loved by God, then Romans 12, verse 1 says, it says, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. You see, when you see yourself as a, as a, as a child of God, where, where, where you know, you're the prince, you're the princess of the king, then you realize that sacrificing your old way of life is really no sacrifice at all. And that's what God requires of us. We need to sacrifice it. We need to get rid of it. We need to destroy it. We need to walk away from it. We need to no longer be identified by our past, but by who God calls us to be. And then it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service or worship. How do we do this? And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is the perfect will of God? It is to walk like a son or daughter with access to every blessing in heaven. That's God's will for you. But you really can't do it as a, you know, if, if you don't, if you're not convinced that God loves you. You know, we get this idea of, how many people know what the word penance means? Penance? P-E-N-A-N-C-E. You know, some churches believe in penance. Penance is where you, you voluntarily uh, punish yourself uh, in order to repent from, uh, from sin or, 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 or whatever. Listen, that is not from God. 
God, God does not require penance. You don't have to beat yourself. You don't have to call yourself word, you know, bad words. You don't have to think of yourself as less than a son or daughter of God. Penance will get you nowhere. Penance will get you in the pit, and every time you, you move in that direction, you just go deeper and deeper and deeper in beating yourself up when, in fact, God sees you through the eyes of love. In 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love. Can't even comprehend it. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. And then Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You're worth 12 cats. I've had the great opportunity to be able to travel in Africa and travel in India. And there are two countries or two areas of the world where dowries are expected when, when a couple get married. The interesting thing is that in India, the, uh, the, the, uh, the bride's family pays the groom's family the dowry. Uh, in Africa, it's the other way around. It's the it's the bride who receive the bride's family who receives the dowry. So if a man wants to marry a, a, a you know a, a girl a woman uh, in in Africa, in the in, in those areas where dowries are still permitted, uh, he would have to pay to marry her. I'd have to put a price on D if I wanted to marry her. I wonder what I would have been willing to pay 54 years ago. <laughs> and, but often the exchange was done in, 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 in you know, if you had money, you'd, you'd, do, you'd use the money. But the other way was in animals. You could, you could transfer animals. Cows were one way to transfer. So if you had a, a, an attractive daughter uh, who could also cook, those were the two the main ingredients. You've got to be pretty and you've got to be able to cook. You could, you could get like three or four cows. But this farmer had several daughters, uh, and, but the one daughter that we're, we want to talk about was the daughter that was uh, uh, not very attractive. She really didn't take care of herself. Uh, she was kind of, you know, down, and, and you know, probably because she was not very good looking, and people, you know, they would tease her, and, and uh, she began to have a poor opinion of herself. But nevertheless, there came a day when a young man from a, from a village far away saw her and fell in love with that daughter. And so the father is very excited because he was going to figure, I'm going to have a hard time getting rid of this girl. And so he says, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I will be able to get three or four cows. And so they have the meeting between the families, and, and, the, and, the, and the young man says, before the father even makes an offer, the young man says, I'm going to give you, I'll give you 12 cows first because I love her. And so what do you think the father said? And the father, yeah, the father said, it's a deal. Take her. So they get married. They move away. And uh, a couple of years go by. And then they return for a visit a couple of years later. And here comes this glorious-looking woman. She is, she is, she just looks so attractive. She just looks so elegant. She just uh, looks so confident, uh, so assured of herself that they don't even, it's hard to recognize that this was the daughter they had. And the reason she changed is because she was worth 12 cows. You are worth infinitely more than 12 cows. God loves you. He, he, and he, he's, he, he's got great things for you. But until you accept the fact that you are loved, 
you're always going to struggle in your walk with him because you're going to believe what the devil says. You're going to believe what your people in your past are. You're going to believe what people in your present are saying that are contrary, that are against what God says. You are the pearl of great price. You were that one sheep that was lost, and, 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 and Jesus went for that one sheep. You're that coin that was lost, and the woman searched throughout her house until she found that coin and she rejoiced. You were that son prodigal son who was lost and then found. And that's what I want you to do today. I want you to find the fact that you are loved by God. Would you stand with me right now?